Namaskara, good evening, and welcome to BIC Streams. Bangalore International Center, or BIC for short, is an inclusive and neutral platform for informed conversation, intellectual dialogue, exchange of ideas, and the arts. This evening's session is the fourth and the last in a series uh, curated by Kenneth Robbins. And today's is titled, Afro-South Asian Historical Projects, the Cosmos Foundation. The Cosmos Foundation's website is devoted to multidisciplinary recovery of the ties between Black and South Asian communities. The Black Story exhibition features the work of five Bangladeshi artists' projects, a heavily illustrated scholarly book documenting the history of Bengali Black interactions across the globe is underway. Several movie projects are under consideration. This session has three presentations. The first presentation by Rosie Llewellyn Jones is titled King Wajid Ali Shah's Africans from Lucknow to Calcutta. The speaker's study of Africans in Lucknow, including Hazrat Mahal, the heroine of 1857-1858, was published in African Rulers and Generals in India. She's following up with a study of Africans who joined the deposed ruler to Calcutta. The second presentation is titled Initiatives of the Cosmos Foundation by Nahar Khan, which delves into the past, current, and future projects of the Bangladesh-based Cosmos Foundation. The final presentation is by Dr. Jamie Cole. Her research interests include South African music and the anti-apartheid struggle from 1948 to 1994, oral histories, music, protests, and human rights. Further, she looks at South African prison memoirs, particularly women's writings and musical traditions. Uh, before we go on, uh, would like, BIC would like to express our deepest gratitudes to Professor Kenneth Robbins for putting this series together and to Ashley, who has uh, been instrumental in getting all the tech right and uh, being quite a resource and a support <laughs> to the series. Uh, the full bios of all the speakers will appear in the chat box, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And if you have any questions, observations, or comments that you would like the speakers to address uh, towards the end of the session, please feel free to use the Q&A box, which is also at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And uh, with that, over to Kenneth. Thank you so much, Leica. And it's been a real privilege to work with you. And I hope that we'll have an opportunity to work again together on other projects. Um, uh, I've completed five books on the relationship between Africans and Indians. Uh, the latest three dealt not only with the African diaspora and communities across South Asia, but also with African rulers, generals, and other elite Africans. And the last dealt with the relationship between uh, Africans and African Americans with India. So the question is, how much more could you do on this? And when we got involved with uh, Nahar Khan of the Cosmos Foundation from Bangladesh, the answer was, well, why don't we try to see what the encounters were between Bengalis and people of African descent across the world? We had had a lot uh, of talk about what had happened uh, with Indians in Africa. And uh, a lot of our work was on Gujarat, but there are loads of Bengalis all over Africa. And, South Africa. Uh, one of the big African, South African politicians was uh, known as the Bengal Tiger. And what was surprising to me is that Bengal uh, was, Bengali was made an official language of Sierra Leone in recognition for the contributions of the Bangladeshi peacekeeping forces in the Civil War. So all sorts of interesting things that we hadn't thought about. We looked at Bengal itself one of the things was there was an African dynasty, the Hapshi East African dynasty of Bengal in the late 15th century uh, that ruled Bengal. And even after that dynasty was uh, crushed, uh, the next dynasty uh, sent a, an African to Mecca to set up this great uh, Islamic school, uh, which we'll be talking about in the book. And also it's curious that the new Sultan uh, made a, um, a manuscript of Alexander the Great defeating legendary 
Africans, the so-called Zangis, who are here sewn with blue skins. And our friend Rosie Llewellyn Jones has worked on uh, uh, Pr Prince Anna Anna Moby, Julius Sartish, who is an Afro-Cuban, uh, Afro-Caribbean uh, slave, uh, who was involved with the uh, with the Duchess of Queens of Queensberry, and then went to Calcutta. She'll tell you a little bit more about him. And then, of course, is a story of Wajid Ali Shah, who had all sorts of Africans in his harem, uh, in his administration in Lucknow, and took a group of them to uh, Calcutta, where he set up a court that was devoted to music and performance. Even the first Nawab of Murshidabad, uh, who was, had an African mother, uh, she was an Abyssinian named uh, Hasina, and American Blacks came to India starting in the 19th century with people like Amanda Berry Smith, who had born a, had born a slave, and uh, Bishop Thornberry, who wrote The Christian Conquest of India, uh, said that uh, she could hold a bigger audience than anybody else. And he learned more from her as a preacher of Christian, tr uh, Christian truth than from any other person he'd ever met. Two of the people who succeeded her uh, as heads of, uh, of YMCA's and Indians were Max Jurgen and his friend C.H. Tobias, though they fell out later. And it was Blacks, and Indians who joined together uh, to uh, look towards the uh, emancipation of India in the 1940s in America. So you have Paul Robeson, the uh, black activist and uh, artist and uh, uh, singer and uh, actor, joining with Kumar Goshal, who was born in Bengal and seeking Indian freedom. And when Gandhi went around Bengal, <clears throat> uh, trying to quiet down uh, some of the disturbance, communal disturbance between Muslims and Hindus, uh, with him was a black American named William Stuart Nelson, uh, who was uh, one of the founders of the nonviolent civil rights movement. And black jazz musicians played all over India, most particularly in Calcutta and Bombay, and in the Grand Hotel in uh, Calcutta, uh, we had Teddy Weatherford, one of the jazz greats. And in America, we had Bardu Ali. Here he is from a 1934 picture. Uh, he not only performed, was a performer uh, of skits, but he was well known as a musician and discovery of all sorts of talent, including Ella Fitzgerald. Uh, he was a manager of, uh, of Red Fox, one of our great uh, com black comedians. And he had a Bengali father and an African-American mother. And we've had many black musicians playing together with Indian musicians. And of course, Ali Akbar Khan's father came from Bengal, Latin Khan, although he made his school in my heart. Uh, and here he is playing with a jazz great, uh, John Handy. And we hope to also find out combinations involving um, other musicians, um, such as in Bangra and so on and so forth. Thank you very much. Um, so now it's time for me to have a special treat and that's to introduce Rosie Llewellyn Jones. And uh, Rosie uh, has uh, been somebody who's been an old friend and uh, she is a me member of the British Empire for her great historical research. And her work on Wajid Ali Shah is, is certainly renowned. Um, and she's somebody who is just a delightful resident. Should I share the screen now, Rosie, or do you want to come on first? Yes. Can we go to the main image? Thank you, that's absolutely fine. So, it's afternoon here in London, so I'm saying good afternoon, but I realize we're spanning three continents. And I was delighted to hear that it's coming from 
Bangalore, Bengaluru, because I was there a few years ago and actually lectured, and I thought it was a delightful place. So I'm a mad <coughs> I'm, I'm there with you now. But we're starting off in Lucknow. I'm going to be dealing mainly with Lucknow and Bengal, obviously northern India. And this is what used to be known as the Fahad Baksh, but it's the house built by Claude Martin, who was a Frenchman but worked for the East India Company for most of his life in India. He was an extraordinary man, a real polymath. But what I wanted to concentrate on now is this is the house where he had a number of African slaves. And unusually, we've got their names because normally these people are faceless and voiceless and nameless. But we do know their names because Claude Martin left them money and pensions in his will. And he also gave them their freedom. So after his death in 1800, they were free men with quite a substantial pension. And this is one of the earliest mentions we've got of Africans in Lucknow. So um, they had curious names. One was called Saint Chagrin, which means in French, obviously, as you know, without bitterness, without anger. And he was commonly known as Chagrin for short. The second one was Anis Syed. So we know that he was of African origin. Another one, the third was Dio Kafos, which I think is probably a mistranslation of Kafir. And then we have two African units, Mahbub, which means darling or beloved, and Amber, which was a very, very common name for African people, particularly in India. So we have these five African slaves, two of them eunuchs, who are looking after Claude Martin's fairly extensive harem of Indian ladies. So imagine that they're here. It was a delightful house. It was on the river. And the reason it's called Chateau de Lyon is that Claude Martin was actually born in Lyon in southern France. So when he started building his houses in Lucknow, he gave it a French name, which is rather a nice conceit. Next, please. And here we have one of the Navabs. I think everyone would be familiar with the um, story of the Navabs of Avad. They were Navabs until 1819, when they were given the title of king by the East India Company. So this is actually King Nusruddin Haider on his rather fancy throne. And he's got his Diwan or Vakil to the right-hand side, who's reading out a partition. But what's interesting is on the left-hand side, we have a man who is clearly of African origin, but a very, very high position. He is holding the chob or the mace, so he's a chobda. He himself has a crown too, and he's dressed very, very ornamentally. Nasruddin Haider had been crowned king and you notice that he's wearing a very peculiar costume, which is not Indian at all, but it is very much the kind of thing that an English king in Britain would wear. It's made out of ermine fur. So you can imagine just how uncomfortable and hot that's going to be. And you notice that um, the man to the left-hand side is also wearing something that looks pretty hot and uncomfortable. And it's, it's following the idea of the English king's coronation. It was a great honor and step up for people who'd been ordinary nubbubs when they were given crowns by the East India Company. But in fact, it really didn't signify very much at all. They were still puppets of the British. And in fact, the whole of Harvard was actually annexed by the British in 1856, as we will see. But for the moment, Nasruddin Haider is enjoying life as a crowned king. And you notice that he's not only got the chatter, the um, sign of royalty above him, he's got a halo as well, which I think is a very nice conceit. So there we are, Nasruddin Haider, about, probably about 18, 1825, about 18, no, sorry, he's a little bit later than that, about 1830, so 1830, in luck now. Next, please. 
And this is the last king, Vajid Ali Shah, about whom I've written. And I put this in because though it's not a terribly good image, it's because the king actually had what he called a black regiment. It was the Hubshian Rishala. And this was made up almost entirely of Africans who had been brought in, not necessarily as slaves, more likely as mercenaries. They would have been recruited in Africa and brought in to form one of the king's regiments. He didn't have a very large army, but this was also in imitation of what was going on further south in Hyderabad, where the Nizam had his own black regiments. So this is Vajid Ali Shah's response to the black regiment. Between Claude Martin's African slaves and Vajid Ali Shah, we have a little bit more information we know that small African boys were imported specifically into Lucknow about 1815, and they acted as jockeys because the Nawab of the time, Sadat Ali Khan, was extremely keen on horse riding and horse racing. So they imported these little black boys um, to act as jockeys, and they trained them. Why they thought little African boys would be better than little Indian boys, I can't say, but we do have this tradition of horse racing. And here you see is Vajid Ali Shah on his horse. And he is the, the last king because the province of Avad was taken over by the East India Company in 1856. And this led almost directly to the great uprising the following year, 1857, which used to be known as the mutiny. And in fact, it did start off as a mutiny of soldiers against their officers, but then spread very, very rapidly into much more civil unrest. So uprising is actually the correct term. Next, please. And Ken had mentioned Begum Hazrat Mahal, and here she is. She's parading in front of the king. She is not yet one of his wives, but there's a fascinating manuscript in the Royal Windsor Castle. It's called the Ishknama, and it's an illustrated autobiography of Vajid Ali Shah. In his young days, it was quite pretentious to actually write an autobiography when you're in your 30s, but nevertheless, that's what he did. And the illustrations are of great interest because page after page, you get these pictures of women coming in and parading in front of the king. It, it's a mixture of an audition and a fashion parade. And this is the first time that this particular page has been identified as that of Hazrat Mahal. And you will see in the title above, it, it says, um, sorry, my, my, my Persian is not that good. Um, Saab Hazrat Mahal. And I was delighted to find it because we'd never had a picture of her before. And here she is. Now, she is interesting because she is the daughter of an African slave called Umba. Again, as I said, it's a common name. And her father worked for a Muslim gentleman called Ghulam Muhammad, and we think in Faisabad. We know her mother's name, but we don't know whether her mother was also African or whether she was Indian or whether she was a mixture. But what we do know about Vajid Ali Shah is he had a weakness for dark-skinned women and particularly African women. And as we go through pages of this lovely manuscript, the Ishknama, we see a number of women who were quite clearly of African origin. It's not quite so clear in this picture of Begum Hazrat Mahal, but nevertheless, it was an Indian researcher who actually found out who her parents were. And I thought that was a marvelous piece of deduction. It was done by looking at the land records. And what the researcher found was that Vajid Ali Shah, when he married Begum Hazrat Mahal, actually gave a grant of land to her father so in effect, he became a free man too. He had his own land and he was freed from slavery. And that happened in 1840. And for a long time, Vajid Ali Shah was extremely fond of Begum Hazrat Mahal. She, she could do no wrong. She actually gave birth to a son, which also 
helped in those times. But when he decided to go to Calcutta after his country had been taken away and his throne had been taken away and his crown too, he left her behind. He divorced her. So she was left in Lucknow with her young son and eventually got to lead the uprising against the British, against the East India Company. She'd come from a very, very humble background. It's possible she was a dancer. And to turn her life around and to lead her countrymen and countrywomen against the British takes a huge amount of courage. There's something very special about this woman. And I'm very glad we have her picture at last. Next, please. And talking about the uprising, this is an interesting photograph. It's a bit of a fake. It was taken in March 1858 by the photographer Felice Beato. And what he'd done to make it look more dramatic, he'd actually got a number of Indian corpses of the rebels, the sepoys opposing the British. He'd got them disinterred and scattered around the courtyard to make it look more authentic. We know that they were not there. And we also know that Beato didn't photograph it immediately after the fighting in Secunderbug. So it's a bit gruesome, but the reason I put it in is that during the Battle of Secunderbug, which was a big walled courtyard, about 2,000 Indian fighters were there, and in a way they'd sort of trapped themselves. They didn't think the um, company armies would break in, but they did. They actually breached the wall, a cannon shot through the wall, and got in and started killing people. But what's interesting is that there's just one report of a number of British soldiers there with their bayonets and their guns, and they're being shot, and they're being shot from above. So they look up, and there's a large tree in the courtyard because it was, it was a country house in a big garden. And someone is shooting at the British soldiers from the tree. So the British themselves start shooting up into the tree. And what happens after a few minutes is that a body falls out of the tree. It's someone who's been shot. And when they, when they look at it, when they look at the body, they find out that it's the body of a woman. For one thing, her blouse is ripped open. They can see it's clearly a woman, but she's an African woman too. And she's one of these select band of bodyguards of the last king, and she was a crack shot. It's quite clear she killed a number of Britishers before she herself was shot. Now, we don't know her name. There was a bust of her put outside the Sekundabad garden a few years ago, but the story has evolved that she was a Dalit. And I want to be quite clear, she wasn't. She was an African woman. All credit her. We don't know her name. She is unnamed. But this is where she fell during the uprising of 1857. And as you know, um, the British actually came back in 1858 when this picture was taken and recaptured the city. And all those men who'd been working for Vajid Ali Shah, for the king, led a miserable existence. They said that they'd actually had to fight for him because he was their master. And they didn't really have pensions. They lived a very, very miserable existence. And the British, because they'd fought for the king, wouldn't actually recompense them. So there are not that many African families left in Lucknow today. I had great difficulty tracing any at all. But they were descendants of the soldiers who'd fought for the king. And some of them actually fought here, including the African woman. Next, please. And when Vajid Ali Shah went to Calcutta, his initial idea was that he was going to um, go to England and appeal to Queen Victoria direct saying, you've taken my country and my throne away. He didn't understand the parliamentary difficulties that in fact, Queen Victoria had nothing to do with the East India Company taking over the province of Abbott but he didn't know that. And in the end, he chickened out and sent his mother, and it was his mother who actually went to England with one of her other sons and met Queen Victoria. And there's a very interesting account from the court diary of 
the Indian queen coming in and she's taken off her veil, which is very, very unusual. And it is commented that she is a very beautiful woman. And she was, she's an absolutely splendid woman. And then there is the Indian description of Queen Victoria coming in, in a circular dress, which is actually a very good description of a crinoline. I'm getting diverted. Um, the reason this is here is that Diana Tadola was again an African eunuch and he accompanied Vajid Ali Shah to Calcutta and he lived there for about 30 years after 1856. He was a wealthy man, a very, very wealthy man. He did very well for himself. He left a lot of money because obviously he didn't have his own children. He left some money to the king and with the surplus, he actually built a kerbala, a sheer shrine in Lucknow. When he died in Calcutta, his body was actually taken by train to the Kerbala and he is buried here. So that gives you an idea of the measure of importance that many of these African courtiers actually had in the Lucknow court. And I think more research will find out that they had that same amount of influence and power in many other courts too. Murshidabad, for example, has not been examined for its African content, but I'm sure it will be there. So this is going back to Lucknow from Bengal. Next, please. And this is one of the ladies that I photographed when I finally managed to find some descendants of the African soldiers in Lucknow, and it was very difficult. I could only do it with the help of Muslim friends. Um, Mrs. Bano is actually in a fairly poor circumstances, and she was looking after with her husband a little mosque in the center of old Lucknow. So she very kindly allowed me to photograph her, which I did. Next, please. And I'm now going on to the last part of my short talk, and I'm talking about Julius Soubise, whom Ken mentioned. Now, he is a really interesting chap. Um, and I suppose he's only come to light fairly recently. What interests me is not so much his career in England that I'll mention briefly, but what he did when he got to India. So Julius Soubies, um, he does have a short entry on Wikipedia. He was born about 1754 in St. Kitts, which is one of the West Indian islands. His mother is supposedly Jamaican and his father was supposed to be an English planter. Um, we simply don't know, but what we do know is that when he was 10 years old, he was sold to the captain of a ship who took him to England. And the captain was actually quite well connected. He wasn't just a normal sort of rough, tough sea captain. He bought Julius and he brought him to London and he introduced him to the Duchess of Queensbury, who was a relative of the sea captain. And the Duchess of Queensbury took him under her wing. Now, we don't know what his original name was. She decided to rename him, and she called him Julius Soubise, which is a fancy French name. So I'm afraid this is the only thing we can call him. We're not going to know what his birth name was, but we're going to call him Julius. So anyway, he does awfully well in London, and he becomes something of a fop, a kind of Beau Brumel figure. And the term for them at the time was macaroni, and it meant a man about town, a man very well dressed, a bit of a fop. And what's interesting about him is that he also took up fencing, which was then becoming quite a gentlemanly sport. It had changed from being an act of aggression to something that gentlemen were happy to do, a bit like taking up golf, if you like. So why is he also called a Mungo macaroni? Because Mungo was a character in a theatrical play in the 18th century. And Mungo is actually played by white actors wearing blackface, which was the convention at the time. And Mungo in the play is a servant, but he's a servant with attitude. He gets drunk, he loses things, he rips off his white masters. And so it becomes a term for 
a black man, an African, if you like. So it's a Mungo macaroni. It's a kind of play and it's a kind of skit. So anyway, Julius is doing awfully well. He's teaching fencing. He's a pet of the Duchess. And it's rumored perhaps he was something more. And everything seems absolutely fine. He learns horse riding. He's a very skilled rider. And everything looks absolutely fine. Next, please. And here he is. This, this is a skit of the Duchess and Sue Bees. And there are sexual connotations. You'll notice that um, Julius, who's actually on the left-hand side, he, he's not wearing a face royal, but the tip of his sword is pointing towards the Duchess's breast. And the Duchess is wearing a foil. And as I say, there were rumors. Um, that's all I can say at the moment. But unfortunately, when the Duchess died about, I think it was about 17, 70, 1780, something like that. Sorry, I should have looked this up. Um, poor old Julius falls out of favor. He's got no patron any longer. He's also accused of raping a maidservant. Again, we don't know whether this was true or not. And it is um, suggested to him that he better leave London, leave high society, he does. And he goes to Calcutta. And for a long time, that's where his story seemed to end. But recently, the diaries of a Calcutta architect, an Englishman acting as an architect in Calcutta, have been found and transcribed. And Julius pops up all the time. So we know now quite a lot of what he was actually doing in Calcutta. He set up a riding school. He also set up a menage, which would actually look after people's horses. It was like a kind of stables and fed them and everything. He was constantly getting in debt. I mean, he was a real character. He was constantly after the ladies too. He did in fact settle down with an English woman. But what interests me, and I am going to do a lot more work on him, probably a biography, he actually spent three years in Lucknow, so that ties us back to Lucknow. And he hired a bungalow from Claude Martin, who had his own African slaves. So I like to imagine the conversations that would have gone on between Martin's slaves and Julius, who was obviously a very sophisticated Londoner. So that's almost the end of the story. Next, please. Yes, I thought I'd finish on this because this is quite a strong image. This was actually painted in London before Julius fell out of favour and went to Calcutta. We don't know who the artist is, but we do know that Julius liked to tell people he was an African prince. He's sort of conveniently, conveniently forgotten the West Indian bit and probably his English father too, but he is a black prince. And his ending was very, very sad. He died when he was only 44 years old. And it, it said that he was trying to tame a horse, um, which was obviously quite sprightly. He was thrown from the horse, it fell onto his head. He started bleeding from his ear and he was taken to hospital. But he died the next day in the arms of his English wife. And he's buried in the cemetery at Bahampur in Calcutta, but very sadly, the majority of the graves were destroyed there in the 1990s. So we're not going to find his tombstone, but I'm going to make sure he's not forgotten. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rosie. Uh, so you can see that we have a lot of things to research to do on Bengal and, and Bengalis and Africans. And the impetus for this came from Narha Khan. Narha Khan is vice president of the Cosmos Group, which is a multi-sector group uh, in uh, Bangladesh. Uh, she uh, is the director of United uh, News of Bangladesh and uh, executive director of the Bangladesh-based gallery Cosmos. She's been involved in telling the black story in many different ways. And I'm going to turn this over to her to tell you about what she's doing. Thank you, Ken. Greetings from Dhaka. Um, as Ken mentioned, I'm um, 
you know, greeting everyone on behalf of the Bangladesh-based think tank, the Cosmos Foundation. And it gives me much pleasure to have an audience with you all this evening. A very warm greeting and thank you to the Bangalore International Center for welcoming my remarks today and Dr. Kenneth Robbins, with whom I have had both the pleasure and privilege of working with. I would also like to take this opportunity to share with you a project I've been involved with. Last year, we conceptualized and curated the Black Story Project, um, a virtual interactive exhibition which took on the powerful combination of multidisciplinary art and, international, and intellectual discourse. This was to deconstruct the historical ties between black and brown communities. Race and color, these you know, socio-political constructs made way for very pervasive prejudice that is still ingrained in our societies today. So the idea was to really implore our own community to challenge notions of colorism, uh, casteism, and anti-Black sentiments, and really see the empowering potential of our shared future. I must mention that this, this entire project has been one that has been very personal to me, and the development of the project deeply transformative. It kind of started off as an idea that was brewing in my head, and, and that translated into conversations in our home in Canada with my Kenyan husband sitting next to our biracial daughter. It was indeed the movement and the mobility of our own families across oceans that essentially made way for the connectedness between us, a Bangladeshi woman and a Kenyan man. So my research started into the historical ties between black and brown communities. I found a wealth of information on black Bengalis much like my daughter, which was brought to my knowledge in the form of a book called Bengali Harlem by Vivek Bald. Bald uncovers a population of Bengali men that jumped ships escaping the engine rooms of British steamers who settled in the United States and assimilated into the communities of Harlem, Detroit, and New Orleans, where they forged lives with and married African-American women. So I realized by now there was a whole generation of biracial descendants just like my daughter. So I delved further into learning. I found a wealth of knowledge on the movement of migration, movement and migration of Africans across the Indian Ocean to South Asia and much due to the work of Dr. Robbins. The Black Story Project really started to then pick apart at all the ways strong solidarity, historical ties and interconnectedness that black and brown communities once shared could again be shared in our future. I've experienced migration, mobility, and the movement of people to create connectedness and the incredible exchange of cultures. But I started to question, what created the disenfranchisement of some people over others? What are the roots of colorism and casteism? What brought on these notions of anti-Black sentiments and the insidious caste system based largely on color? How can we be mindful of the, base, of, of the biases we carry the racism and colorism we uphold and even perpetuate? And how can we be better than the societies we were perhaps raised in? How is it that Africans were an indelible part of South Asian history and heritage through their roles as soldiers, generals, traders, and rulers, but were many times misrepresented in South Asian art or the world around us? Through these many existential questions, the Black Story Project was conceptualized and curated to implore our own communities to be anti-racist, to embrace our connectedness, and really explore issues around race, identity, and power. I really believe that art has the power to, to disrupt hegemonic dis representations. So we worked with five brilliant Bangladeshi visual artists that showed solidarity to the black community through multidisciplinary art and through disruptive curatorial practices to really reinforce the message of humanity's absolute equality. And to that effect, the virtual uh, exhibition space has been designed as a rotunda, a sort of circular platform symbolizing equality, solidarity, and a sense of universality that encompasses the themes explored in our exhibition. 
I would now like to take this opportunity to show you a short trailer of the Black Story Project. <laughs> These are the five Bangladeshi artists that showed solidarity uh, to the Black community by using various mediums and they themselves really delved into the research and journey down their individual creative processes. Here are some of the artworks that were created over a period of, of about six months before the inaugural event. We also had a number of webinars to discuss various topics surrounding race, identity, and power. Um, as you can see, one of the webinars were on amplifying Black music and culture. Um, we also featured a, a Black artist, Osi Audu, who's uh, based in the United States, um, who works strongly with African identity. We also had Dr. Robbins as one of our speakers, working, um, speaking on, on much of the work that he's done. And then, of course, dismantling anti-Blackness in South Asia and diaspora. Throughout the period of the, the project, um, which is still um, archived online and can be accessed, we had several resource materials which were also posted. For example, the model minority myth, uh, why all lives matter can be problematic, um, the power of peaceful protest, um, you know, a, a lot to do with cultural appreciation and appropriation, and um, even texturism and futurism. So the, these were kind of our awareness content that we posted throughout the course of the project. <laughs> this is a little bit into the virtual gallery space, which can be accessed online as well. So we'll do this very quickly. Mm -hmm. You may write me down in history with your bitter twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still like dust, I rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Just cause I walk as if I have oil wells pumping in my living room. Just like suns and like moons with the certainty of times, just like hope springing high. Still I rise. Did you want to see me broken? Bowed head and lowered eyes. Shoulders falling down like teardrops. Weakened by my soulful cries. Does my sassiness upset you? <laughs> Don't take it so hard just because I laugh. <laughs> As if I have gold mines digging in my own backyard. You can shoot me with your words. You can cut me with your lies. You can kill me with your hatefulness. But just like life, I rise. Does my sexiness offend you? Oh. Does it come as a surprise that I dance as if I have diamonds at the meeting of my thighs? Out of the huts of history, shame, I rise. Up from a past rooted in pain, I rise. A black ocean leaping and wide, welling and swelling, I bear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. Into a daybreak miraculously clear, I rise. Bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave, I am the hope and the dream of the slave. 
And so, naturally, they are grown. So we are um, currently working on the Black Story Project's namesake book, where we dive deeper into the connectedness between Black and Brown uh, communities through migration, political ideology, art, music, culture, and food. Uh, several film projects are also in the works, which are taking more shapes. So our hope is that we can really play a pivotal role in creating uh, conscious, connected, and inclusive communities that at times stand more divided than not. Um, I welcome you all to explore our virtual gallery, resources, webinars, and video features on our website at www.theblackstory.com and on Instagram at The Black, Black Story Project. Thank you so much for your time today. Well, thank you so much, Naraha. It was fantastic. Uh, in the last two uh, conferences, we discussed music in a number of different ways. One was uh, the relationship between black jazz musicians in America and India. Uh, and then we talked about the Malunga, the African bow and its history in India and Africa and the transmission of music. But we have an unusual guest next a uh, person who not only started with talking about Renaissance and early Baroque music in her work, uh, but somebody whose work is transformational in its ability to be inclusive. She is a lecturer at the University of Cape Town, College of, of Music, and the head of the uh, Kakutana uh, Musical Ensemble. And um, she has been working on recentering Afro-Asia, musical and human migrations in pre-colonial period before the 15th, uh, before 1500. And a particular interest to me was her involvement <laughs> in the musical culture of the Christian kingdom of Ethiopia. So I'd like to introduce you to Janie Cole. Janie? Thank you very much. Um, Thank you very much to Dr. Gen, Ken Robbins for the invitation. I don't think I've ever been called an unusual guest, so uh, I will take that as a compliment. Thank you, Ken. And also to the uh, Bangalore International Centre for welcoming me um, today. So I'm just going to share my screen. I hope you can all hear. Thank you. So um, today, uh, the title of my talk is Reconstructing 16th Century Afro-Asian Soundscapes. Gable's Odyssey and uh, Janjira. And today I want to talk uh, to you about the work that I've been doing with the Kukutana Ensemble, which develops original musical narratives combining music, poetics, and visual effects rooted in repertories of indigenous East African communities, their musical cultures, and historical links to a pre colonial Indian Ocean world soundscape from the 8th to the 17th centuries. Um, it's a group that I founded last year with master musicians and artists from South Africa, India, Ethiopia, and Tanzania. And then we have uh, guest artists, depending on the projects that we're working on. And the idea is to bring to life through historical narratives in music, the movement of people's civilizations and cultures through the impact of war, slavery, trade routes, religion, and aesthetic constellations around ports, polities, and kingdoms, in order to, or to explore wider themes of musical and human migrations, encounters, displacement, identity, and cross-cultural exchanges between East Africa and the Indian Ocean world. So this work, um, just to give you a sense of the, the wider um, picture here, this work is situated in my wider academic research, which focuses on music in the Christian kingdom of early modern Ethiopia, and transcultural encounters with Latin Europe and the Indian Ocean world, especially Western India. This was part of the University of Cape Town's multidisciplinary project called Recentering Afro-Asia, Musical and Human Migrations in the Pre-Colonial Period from 700 to 1500 AD, in collaboration with several African universities and the University of Ambedkar, and funded until last year by the Mellon Foundation. Of course, we know that the Indian Ocean was a rich contact zone that is central to our, our understanding of cultural and specifically musical 
diversity in this vast region in East Africa, and in particular in Ethiopia or Abyssinia, as it was known in the early modern period uh, under consideration. The historical presence of Abyssinians in the Indian Ocean world and links between Abyssinia and India can be traced back to ancient times. Indian figurines were imported into Ethiopia as early as the third century BC, according to archaeological finds. The anonymous first century AD Greek author of the Periplus of the Erythranian Sea, a merchant sailor's guide, writes of the importance of trade between East Africa, the Arabian Peninsula and the Indian subcontinent after the discovery by the ancient Romans of the alternation of the monsoon winds. The Roman writer Pliny the Elder, who died in 79 AD, in his Natural History of 77 AD, also refers to trade between the Red Sea and India and described Bari Gaza as, quote, an Ethiopian town because of the abundance of East African traders who had settled there. The Aksumites were, according to Richard Pankhurst, great traders with Arabia, Egypt, Rome, Persia, and India, exporting frankincense and myrrh, ivory, gold, salt, and slaves in exchange for cotton glassware, raw, raw metals, swords, and axes. The Ethiopians who first came to India as traders and seamen were called Habshi. Cities came from coastal and inland parts of East Africa and were brought as slaves to India as early as in 628 AD at Baruch port. And evidence of trade between Ethiopia and India and Ceylon is given in the narrative of pseudo calisthenes in, in the topography of Cosmos Indico Plustus, and ships from Ethiopia, specifically Adulis, sailed as far as Bari Gaza and even Ceylon in the fifth and sixth centuries. Material evidence of connections between Ethiopia and India is provided by a hoard of Kushana gold coins found at Dabragat Davo in northern Ethiopia. And by the early 14th century, Habshi were widely distributed from North India to Ceylon and were chiefly employed as soldiers and guards. Large numbers were also present in Bengal in the 15th century and they rose to positions of eminence there in the Deccan and elsewhere. By the early 16th century, Ethiopia continued to share important links to India as several Ethiopian cities enjoyed the benefits of long distance trade and were well connected to the Red Sea and Indian Ocean world, such as Barada, which was often the site of the Ethiopian royal camp, uh, which in this period was, um, was a traveling uh, itinerary, uh, sorry, itinerant court, and the port of Zyla. These seafaring and trade trading networks helped to create and disseminate new languages, ideas, religious practices, technologies, people and goods, musical traditions and practices, instruments, melodies from the East African coast to Western India, as sailors, soldiers, merchants, slaves, eunuchs, musicians, concubines, and workers in dockyards, plantations, and salt marshes develop diasporic communities of their own. By the mid 16th century, with Goa now under rule by the Portuguese, Missionaries embarked on a new mission to the Christian kingdom of Ethiopia, leading to one of the most ancient and remote Christian churches being brought, albeit temporarily, under the authority of Rome. The Jesuit period in Ethiopia is the current focus of my work in reconstructing musical culture at the Ethiopian royal court through 16th and 17th century travelers' accounts, surviving Jesuit documentation and indigenous sources. Um, these indigenous sources survive from the 1300s on in the form of uh, royal chronicles, for example. New ambitious architectural projects were undertaken as symbols of religious renewal and supremacy, and music was central to Jesuit conversion practices, which incorporated both local Ethiopian and Indian influences. Indeed, architects, master masons, and artists came from India and Europe to produce these highly original sacred spaces. While the workforce was local, Ethiopian, the arch architectural design inspiration was unmistakably was unmistakably from Catholic Europe, as well as Mughal and Portuguese India. So you can see here this church of Martula Mariam um, on the Ethiopian highlands with the uh, highly decorative arches and pillars, the, insp the Indian inspirations there uh, in design and masonry. Another example, the design of the church of Gorgora Yasus on Lake Tana was inspired by San Paolo in Dieu, 
as archival documents reveal that architect Raul Martins used in Ethiopia the same plans that he had used in, in India. The analysis draws attention to the Jesuit Indian network, especially the houses of Goa and Dieu, and shows that the architectural choices and use of Indian masonry and building techniques in Ethiopia were mirrored in sound as European liturgical music was combined with indigenous African sounds played by Indian slave musicians. Now, this project um, gives you the much wider, wider scope of the um, current projects that I want to talk to you about. Um, you know, it's a whole other paper, really. But the point is, is that these transcultural musical encounters and migrations between Ethiopia and India against the wider backdrop of slavery in the Indian Ocean world are central. The Italian traveler Ludovico di Vartema noted in his Itinerario in, early, in the early 16th century how Ethiopian slave soldiers were taken by the Moors to the port of Zyla on the Gulf of Aden and from there, quote, carried into Persia, Arabia, Felix, and to Mecca, Cairo, and into India, unquote. Many Ethiopian slaves, the majority Christian Oromo, also called Gala, filled the markets at Gondar and Gala, Galabar to supply the Muslim markets. They were treated as a commodity bought and sold in markets located on the trade routes, stripped of all their property, belongings, and homeland, but they would have retained their cultural identity and musical heritage and reproduced their music in their new environments using perhaps makeshift instruments with spontaneous dancing accompanying the music. And many of these traditions were passed down through generations of Afro-Asians without being recorded. Most of these Ethiopians were slave soldiers being transported as a military force by Arabs to various parts of the Indian Ocean. As well as serving in military roles, Ethiopians continued to trade directly with outlying ports in the Indian Ocean. Along the western coast of India, Ethiopians built a chain of fortifications controlling sea access from Daman down to the island of Janjira, south of Bombay. There, beginning in the early 17th century, Habshi sailors turned rulers established a royal lineage that reigned for nearly 300 years. Now, these Afro-Asian links form the backbone of two projects by the musical Kukutana Ensemble, which I want to focus on now. The first is Gabriel's Odyssey. Now, through the waves of the pandemic last year in 2021, we worked virtually across, um, across uh, two continents and over 10 months on producing Gabriel's Odyssey, which premiered in Cape Town in October 2021. I first came across the biography of, of Gabriel, Gabriel, an Ethiopian slave, through the historical reconstruction of his life and times by the historian Matteo Salvadori. Other scholars have worked also on constructing Gabriel's life story, including Giuseppe Marcocci, Ananya Chakravati, and Patricia Souza de Faria, who all base their analyses on a manuscript source from the Inquisition archive in Lisbon, 1595, dated 1595, a manuscript copy of Proceedings of a Trial, Tribunal do Santo Oficio of the Inquisition de Lisboa, entitled Processo de Gabriel Casta Abexim que veio de Chaul remetido a esta mesa, file number 4937. So Gabriel, Gabriel, of Abyssinian caste was a better Israel Ethiopian Jew who was kidnapped as a young child from the Ethiopian highlands and sold into slavery in the Arab world in the mid 16th century. After two decades of enslavement in Arabia where he converted to Islam and took the name Ali Han, he was sold again and found himself in the Ahmadnagar Sultanate in India where he served Mullah Mahmed as a stable boy for many years. Mistreated by his master, their relationships soured further when Gabriel got involved with a Moorish woman called Misha Kobar. The lovers fled to the Estado da India and reached Portuguese Chao, where they found refuge with the Dominican priests of Our Lady of Guadalupe. They converted to Christianity and found domestic employment in the house of a Christian woman of Abyssinian caste. Only two months later, Gabriel fled back to the uncertainty of, of Mahmoud Nagar and reinvented himself again as a Muslim for the next six years, then went back to Chaul, where he came to the attention of the Portuguese Inquisition. You can see here on the maps the various movements that he made and the years. 
So when he gets picked up by the Portuguese in Inquisition, he was imprisoned in Chao, deported to Goa, and there he faced two trials as a relapsed Muslim. So you can see the irony of having been, uh, um, you know, and the, the changes of identity and religious identity, having been born uh, Jewish, converted to Islam, converted to Christianity, again, in, a, a, in, in um, recasting himself, and then being tried by, uh, by the uh, Goan Inquisition as a relapsed Muslim. The trial papers, which now survive in the archives in Lisbon, contain Gabriel's life story as recounted by himself when he was being questioned during the trials in Goa. Now, Gabriel's story is a difficult one to tell, especially in musical form. It is an, it is an, it is an Afro-Indian story of slavery, mobility, persecution, love and resistance, which offers rare views into the early modern Indian Ocean world, enslavement on the Ethiopian highlands, slave trading in the Arab world, Habshi life through the porous borders of the Indo-Portuguese frontier, and religious persecution in Portuguese India. It appears to be the earliest surviving autobiographical account by an enslaved Ethiopian, yet represents a universal story of oppression, migration, and refashioning like the experiences of countless other early modern Africans across the Indian Ocean world. Gabriel transited through interconnected African, Arab, and Indian worlds as a Jew, a Muslim, and a Christian in a 16th century global life history of forced labor, abuse, surveillance, and resilience in disparate locales of the Indian Ocean world. Despite his African identity, Gabriel exploited the opportunities for mobility and conversion through active agency that the region's borders offered to emancipate himself from multiple experiences of oppression. It is the rare life story of a non-elite Habshi slave as told by himself in an interplay of his better Israel ancestry, his stated religious affiliations, and the consequences of his perceived African identity and status. So focusing on this idea of the colonial archive, Gabriel's story survives through the lens of the 16th century archival papers of the Goan Portuguese uh, Inquisition in Goa, where, quote, Gabriel of Abyssinian caste, unquote, was condemned to two trials in 1595. So there are gaps and nuances and questions of representation, what was said and not said under duress for the sake of survival, and so on. One aim behind Gabriel's Odyssey in recreating a musical narrative based on these archival sources and this uh, true story is to explore artistic ways of experimenting with and reworking archival sources and decolonizing the stories of Africans that emerge out of colonial archives, such as the Inquisition archive in Lisbon. Without the colonial records and surviving manuscripts of his trials by the Goan Inquisition, Gabriel's autobiography would have been lost forever, like those of countless other Africans from this period. However, his story and voice are recorded through the Inquisition's notary and a translator, adding further colonial layers to the version of his life story that has survived. Indeed, scholars have written at length about the limitations and possibilities of the colonial archive, whether insisting that the colonial archive can only be used to write discursive histories of modern power, Premish Lalu, for example, his analysis, or rethinking ways to make the colonial archive productive, Laura Stola, or on how to reconstruct an archive for a pre-colonial period, drawing from colonial sources, indigenous knowledge systems, and intangible culture, Carolyn Hamilton. Gabriel's Odyssey strives to recast Gabriel in our imagined reconstruction of his own voice, his inner and outer worlds, thus giving back his agency, but without a truth or historical accuracy, aside from drawing on the scant sources that exist. Um, so to depict him as a man with agency over his own inner life, the writers drew on source materials that could give a sense of the physical and emotional realities of the world he was born into on the Ethiopian highlands and the life of an African slave in Arabia and India. The artworks formed part of an imagined Indian Ocean aesthetic and the idea of a perceptual culture, that is a multi-sensory realm and Sufi Islam with a sensual engagement with sound, touch, taste, scent, exploring the material aspects of water, sound, metal, and light, which are 
you know, central themes to his story. And lastly, the musical compositional pro processes drew inspiration from the different communities that Gabriel comes across in his journey across the Indian Ocean world, such as the canticles of the Beta Israel Jews in Ethiopia, to Gujarati Maulud, to Konkani Mando. We work across indigenous instruments and languages to bring Gabriel's imaginary soundscapes and musical textures from his story to life. So I just want to end the talk now playing some extracts from Gabriel's Odyssey. Um, the first example, um, this, this scene recalls Gabriel's memories of Ethiopia, a Jewish child growing up in the Simeon Mountains through a better Israel hymn um, accompanied on the Masinko, the Masinko um, being the traditional instrument, the one stringed lyre that was used uh, for secular music uh, by um, uh, Asmari musicians. Uh, so here it is. So this is from our performance. Not Gabriel will actually do it. Then you had this one. And he Gabriel in our go and know. Abreu after a fetch a chin at the good. of indigenous instruments from these different regions and languages uh, lies at the core of these musical textures. In this next example, uh, Gabriel himself talks of his childhood among the goats, accompanying himself on the washint flute. Um, and to find these, these indigenous instruments outside of Ethiopia, um, you know, is, is really quite rare. So you really don't see them in South Africa, for example. And the canarasu tamet him yabela. Berialantama An instrumental piece on the canoon transitions into Gabriel's life in Arabia, where he converts to Islam and becomes Ali Han. work explores questions of spirituality and here Gabriel relapses again, um, again a juxtaposition of languages and musical genres in this um, song. Mm -hmm. 
Taking sources from 14th and 15th century uh, traditional songs, um, it's also a love story. Here, Misha expresses her love for Gabriel. which Gabriel responds accompanied on the Qurar in Amharic. Gabriel returns to foreign lands, Misha loses him and expresses her sorrow. Oh, 
And the soundscape includes other textures and sounds, for example, Dominican chants to represent the Inquisition, overlapping with Gabriel's inner conflicts. currently looking for funding to tour Gable's Odyssey internationally and also to work on our next musical project, Janjira, which will tell the story of the island fortress established in the 15th century and run by Siddhis, descendants of East African slaves and the history of African rulers in India. In both our projects, Gable's Odyssey and Janjira, questions of representation abound in attempting to recreate in soundscapes, visuals and poetics from Ethiopia, Arabia and India, a 16th century Indian Ocean world of slavery, power, bodily violence, black bodies, religion, love and resistance that formed the backbone of these histories. These are the questions that can be addressed when focusing on the actual artistic, musical and scholarly processes involved in creating such works. Thank you very much. Well, uh, with that, we come to the end of a fantastic series covering the spectrum of the impact the African diaspora has had on the South Asian region and the Indian Ocean world. The series covered histories of African descendants rising to powerful positions in the first session, African rulers and generals in India with speakers Omar Ali and Pushkar Soni. We discovered stories of spiritualism, religion and music, particularly jazz, in the second session, Black Ambassadors of Politics, Religion and Jazz in India with Sushil Korean and delved into the stories of the African diaspora communities and the evolution of indigenous music with Professor Purnima Mehta Bhatt, Professor Amy Caitlin Jaraz Boy and Nuko Senati Erni Koela in the third lecture. This session uh, has been incredibly moving with some information on historical facts that have been personally start startling and enlightening to me, to say the least. And I hope our audiences think so as well. Thank you for a lovely evening of history, music, and a look at stories that have been relegated to the back rooms of mainstream historical <laughs> research. Thank you, Rosie, Nahar, and Janie for the spectacular work that you have brought to us this evening. Our deepest gratitude to Dr. Robbins, for bringing us this galaxy of scholars and speakers uh, and making uh, this uh, accessible to the layperson. Uh, and all I have to say now is uh, thank you, good evening, and uh, hope to see you all soon. Thank you to the Bangalore International Center.